them to shift over here from where it should have been. Okay. The original Hebrew text does not have punctuation in it. Mm -hmm. So you kind of got to figure out where the colons go, the commas go, the periods go, the question marks. And you know that all gets into our English translation, but the original doesn't have that. So when you look at what it says on creation day three, it says, let the land produce deshef. That's a Hebrew word which means vegetation. Generic, anything that's photosynthetic comes under that category. So even unicellular photosynthetic life forms would be under that category. Now, I believe that uh, if you were to translate it correctly, let the land produce deshef colon. Here are three examples. And it mentions uh, three Hebrew words that are typically translated uh, trees, fruit, and seeds. Now, it's also important to realize that in the original Hebrew words for trees, fruit, and seed, they're way more generic than the English equivalents. So when we see the word trees, fruit, and seed, we think apricots. However, if you look at the original Hebrew, the word for tree uh, can refer to any vegetation material that's got some level of stiffness to it. So, for example, a long line of cells that are joined together that have some uh, stiffness in it, that falls under the category of trees. doesn't come under our category of trees. We think oak trees, uh, firs, uh, apricots, uh, but a stalk of celery, for example, would, would qualify as a tree based on that term. As I said, even a, a long line of cells that have some measure of stiffness to it would qualify. Like word, the word for a seed basically refers to embryo. Well, guess what? Every plant species has an embryo. Uh, and likewise, the word for fruit refers to the food that the seed uses to germinate. Well, once again, that's a generic term that would refer to all vegetative material. But I think it's important to realize when it says, let the land produce the chef, here are three examples. It's not meant to be exhaustive. You say, why does it pick those three? Those are the three that people who are not aware of a fossil record uh, would be familiar with. And so given that this is designed to communicate to Christians that are reading the biblical text over a span of 3,500 years, put yourself back 3,500 years ago, uh, would people be aware of cryptogamic crusts? Living in Israel, probably not unless they went up to some of the higher mountains. Uh, or would they be aware of uh, sulfate-reducing bacteria? Probably not. Uh, or microbes, I mean, those weren't discovered until you know, 300 years ago. So it's using terms that people at that time would be familiar with, but what impresses me, even in that context, it uses much more generic words than the English equivalent. You know, people always ask me, how come as people who speak English that have all these fights over what the Bible teaches about creation? Well, it's because English, you have the greatest challenge in translation. You're taking one of the world's smallest vocabulary languages, namely Biblical Hebrew, and translating it into the biggest vocabulary language that has ever existed. So you've got the two extremes. A vocabulary that if you don't count the names of people and cities, has only 3,000 words into a vocabulary that has four million words. So we would expect that there would be some translation issues. But the good news is English is where you got the greatest number of translations. I mean, if you're familiar with Bible Gateway, that's uh, a website, it gives you access, I think the current count, it's over a little over 40 different English translations of the Bible. And they, they give them all to you for free. So you can read all 40 for free. Uh, I use that with my phone because, uh, you know, one translation will pick up one aspect of the Hebrew, another will pick up a different one. You say, uh, well, which one's which? When you pick up your Bible, always read the preface. The preface will tell you the biases that they use in translation. And so, you know, like the New American Standard Bible will say, what we're trying to do is go for a word-for-word -word translation. And yeah, we pick one of the words, and they make the whole point. Because if we're going from a tiny vocabulary to a large vocabulary, they may have picked the wrong word, but they try to be word-for-word. 
Uh, some translations actually try to be literal with the grammar. They want to copy the same grammar that's in the original Hebrew into English. Even if the grammar isn't very comfortable for us reading in English because they want to communicate that. The Living Bible, if you read their preface, says, we want to communicate the emotion that's being communicated in the text. So, for example, when I want to show my sons all the humor that's in the Old Testament, I'll probably use the Living Bible because it does a really good job on translating the humor. New American Standard Bible, forget trying to get any humor out of it. It's just not there. So, and you know, when people say, boy, this is really dull, well, hey, you know, read it in a couple of other translations and you'll get the full sense of what's going on. But I'm also saying it's not exhaustive. Mm -hmm. It's three examples out of hundreds of examples that could have been chosen. And that's why I'm saying, why did it pick those three words? Well, in terms of the words yet available in <laughs> Biblical Hebrew, yeah. those are the words that people living 3,500 years ago would have some idea what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So, and you say, well, wouldn't it be more accurate if it actually told us exactly what these uh, things were? Well, back then, people didn't have a clue. And so, you know, using terms like sulfate-reducing bacteria wouldn't be much help to people living in Moses' generation. So before the colon or desh, after that, how do you pronounce it? Desh? That is very broad. The word desh is desh. very broad, right. right. And then the three after or, or are examples. Are three specific examples. Three specific three examples three. out of many. Okay. And so... That's the problem. The reason why people have fought over that text, they think those three words exhaustively describe the range of what happened in creation day three. There are three examples of the deshet. And a lot of people reading in English don't even figure out, you know, let the land produce vegetation. They go straight to trees, fruit, and seed. So they miss that word deshet, which actually comes first. And so I think in that context, you know, there is no reason to fight over this text or to think it any way conflicts what we know from the fossil record of plant life. The word for seed, is that specific or general? The word seed, I mean, again, you only got the one Hebrew word that refers to that item that allows the plant to reproduce. Okay. Uh, a better translation, in my opinion, would be embryo. Okay, and all vegetation has some kind of embryo. Well, because if you were to use the word embryo to someone who lived 3,500 years ago, they would say, what are you talking about? Seed, they understand. So, and keep in mind, you only got that one word. See, in English, we got all kinds of words for different kinds of embryos. Uh, but in Hebrew, biblical Hebrew, you just got that one word. But yeah, it would be more accurate, in my opinion, to translate it as embryo because that would communicate uh, the, the, how generic that uh, Hebrew word is. Uh, however, uh, I think the reason why uh, translators use the word seed, that's how people 3,500 years ago would understand it. They wouldn't understand the word embryo. And it's the principle is this. The Bible is designed to communicate to humans living across 40 different generations. Uh, hundred different generations for that matter. And so uh, you want to translate the Bible in a way that would have some meaning for people living across all generations. So for example, nowhere in the Bible where you see a reference to neutrons, even though there are places where you say, you know, that'd be really the right term to put in here. But since people 3,000 years ago wouldn't have a clue what you're talking about, uh, it uses something more generic. In fact, we'll see that in one of the texts we're studying this morning. Yes. Yeah, in support of what you're saying, in, in back 3,000 years ago when the Bible was written, uh, there were ferns. Ferns are, are higher plants, but they do not have seeds. They only have spores, you know, and, and they had them then. So they would have used that same word for the spores, uh, the shock, that's the word. 
Uh, well, well, the word that's translated seed, and try to think of the example of Zera. Zera is the word for seed, and uh, uh, that would include spores, right. as so well as. And they knew about ferns. They certainly did, and they would have called them. That they would have used that same word. Well, I'm guessing too. They knew about seeds where you have just one component as opposed to one that's split into two. So yeah, I mean, but again, in English, we actually have separate words for all these different kinds of seeds, spores, and embryos. In biblical Hebrew, you got one catch-all term. The problem is when you translate into English, you can't pick a catch-all term. What about fruit? Same thing. The word fruit uh, basically refers to any kind of food supply that sustains the embryo long enough that it can become an adult plant. And again, that's, I mean, again, in English, we think of, well, peaches and apricots, uh, but the truth is uh, there's a food supply for the spore of a fungus that enables it to become a full-grown uh, mold. There was a hand over here, yeah. You know, one way in which you can think about it that kind of makes the opposite point is that there's many words that we have in this language. We only have one word for snow. And there's an Eskimo tribe I read that has like 13 different words for different kinds of snow. I mean, I've heard it's over 30. There's over 30 different kinds of snow. Well, I've met some Inui, and what they tell me is, don't try to make an igloo with the wrong kind of snow. It won't work. <laughs> the reason why they have all these different words for snow is they use these different kinds of snow for different purposes. But they actually have a word for the kind of snow that's optimal for making an igloo. And yeah, if you watch them make an igloo, within an hour, the igloo is completely built. They can do it that fast if they got the right kind of snow. And they basically wait for that kind of snow to form before they make igloos. But where I lived, whenever it snowed, it was useless for making igloos. It was just too wet. <laughs> if it's too dry or too wet, you can't make igloos out of it. And it's got to set for a period of time before it actually can be cut into blocks that have got some strength. There was a question back here somewhere? No? Yeah? I was just going to say that Mark Cedar, he talked about the same kind of snow. He talked about how it is. Yeah, you do. And, uh, well, what I remember is uh, when you're uh, doing cross-country skiing, they talk about different kinds of snow, how you actually wax your skis for those different kinds, and they actually have different words. So we actually do have words for different kinds of snow. Uh, but for those of us who don't do cross-country skiing and don't build igloos, it's just snow, right? <laughs> Here in California, how many of you have even seen snow, okay? <coughs> All right. Yeah, well, I keep remembering how we would entertain these students from South Asia, and uh, they had never seen snow before. It was always a real treat in wintertime to take them up to Mount Baldy, where they get to see snow for the first time. Just what a wonder it was for them. And I think there's something important about that. That's in one of our verses in Isaiah about creation, that every bit of it, should cause us to be awestruck by what we see. And yeah, I mean, we take snow for granted. I remember looking at the faces of these uh, students uh, from uh, Southeast Asia. And when they saw that snow coming down from the sky, you'd think that they were looking at the seven wonders of the world. Because it was just such an awesome thing that they were watching, this white stuff coming down and how it actually, you could uh, taste it and it would refresh you. Okay, all right. No more questions, let's jump into our Isaiah uh, text. Okay. Okay, these are the different texts that pertain to uh, God creating the universe. That's question one on our sheet here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna blast through really quickly the passages we've been looking at for the past three or four weeks, and then I'll stop when we get to one we haven't covered yet, okay? So uh, beginning with Isaiah 6, 3, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. His glory fills the whole earth. And what we discern from that, this text is telling us that every part of God's creation reveals God's glory. So that would refer to a cockroach. It would refer to some particle of dust in the asteroid belt. 
Every bit of it communicates God's glory, and it's actually an exhortation. We need to look for that glory in everything we see in creation. You know, if it looks ugly, you're not really seeing the glory of God. So get past what you think is ugly. And then Isaiah 14, 24, the Lord of hosts has sworn, as I have purposed, so it will be as I have planned it, so it will happen. And our discussion evolved around how this text is telling us there are no accidents or random outcomes in God's creation. Everything's under his control. Every outcome and event has a purpose. A lot of it seems random and chaotic to us. In fact, we talked about how it must seem random and chaotic to us in order for us to even possibly exist. I won't go into the details. That took about half the class time. So I'm not going to repeat that. Isaiah 14, 27. The Lord of hosts himself has planned it. Therefore, who can stand in its way? It is his hand that is outstretched, so who can turn it back? And we discern that this text is telling us nothing stands in the way of God's purposes and plans. In Isaiah 37, 16, the Lord of hosts, God of Israel, who is enthroned above the cherubim, that's a reference to the higher angels. You are God, you alone of all the kingdoms of the earth, you made the heavens and the earth making the point that God is the only agency of creation. There is no other factor. Notice this text is contrasting God with a cherubim. These are the greatest and most powerful of the angels, and says, nope, they don't have the power. I'm the only one that's got the power to create. There is no one else, and no other factor. You know, here we have physicists speculating today that some impersonal agency did a lot of this stuff, this text is telling us, no, it's God and God alone. Yes? Was Lucifer included in the class of cherubim? Uh, Lucifer is not referred to as part of the cherubim. The cherubim are 100% committed to God, so Satan wouldn't be in that category. Uh, but Satan is referred to as the most powerful of the angels that God created. We're going to come up with another text that implies not even Satan has the power or capacity to create. God alone. Okay, that's where you're going. Yeah. Well, it's important because there's a lot of theology that's crept into the Christian church making the point that God challenged uh, Satan to create. And he messed it up so badly, God says, no, I'm going to take over. The problem with that theology is these texts in Isaiah tell us even Satan doesn't have that power. It's within God alone the capacity to create. Okay, Isaiah 40 uh, verse 5, the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all mankind together will see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. As many of you realize, this made it into uh, uh, George Handel's Messiah, uh, where, again, he chose this text for the Messiah, making the point, God's glory is evident to every human being. Every human being has heard. The Lord has spoken it. And because God has spoken it so clearly through creation, everyone has the capacity to see God's glory. And you say, well, how come some people claim they've never seen the glory of God? They haven't looked. A lot of us don't look, and especially those of us living in big cities, we don't go outside and look. You won't see it if you just stay in your office. You've got to go outside and take a look. But it's been revealed to everyone. Yes. Why is it in the future tense? The glory of the Lord will be revealed. All mankind together will see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Basically making the point, if you actually expose yourself, you will see it. That's why I was making the point. Yeah, a lot of people claim, hey, what the Bible says is totally fallacious. I know lots of people who don't see the glory of God. Well, you have to go outside and actually look. And this is a promise. If you go and look, you will see it. But the responsibility is upon us. So basically God is telling us, it says in Romans 1, 19, we're all without excuse because God has clearly revealed himself and his attributes through the creation. But the responsibility is on us to actually read the book of nature. And yeah, thousands of years ago, everybody was reading the book of nature. Today, there's lots of people who simply haven't taken advantage of reading that book of nature. Yes, Doug. And of course, that was an exclusive glory rather than a thing complete that glory. Right. So. Probably all the 
Well, it's basically making a promise too. The more you look, the more of God's glory you will see. And so, and you know, hopefully when you get exposed to God's, God's glory uh, through the book of nature, it'll get you so excited, you're gonna wanna see more. That's one of the reasons why our team at Reasons to Believe every week puts out a new article. Here's a new discovery from nature that reveals the glory of God. Every day, we're seeing more of God's glory revealed in nature. But again, you gotta go out and look. And in some cases, we don't go out inside and look, we read the scientific journals. In the scientific journals, we see people often against their own will, uh, revealing the glory of God. Yes? Would you define the word glory as a change in verses like this? Okay, big debate over exactly what does this glory mean. Uh, people have talked about it. it reveals the majesty of God, the power of God. And so the word glory is kind of a, a catch-all term for God's great attributes. Some scholars acclaim it also includes God's holiness, which is why when we look at the book of nature, there's a sense of awe and fear that comes over us when we recognize what I see in nature is a God that is righteous. In fact, we're going to see some texts that explicitly tell us this that the heavens, the universe that God created, reveals the righteousness of God, referring to the fact that he is holy. When we look at that and look at ourselves, we realize he's holy, I'm not. And what does that mean about me? However, as we go through some of these texts, it makes the point that God is the creator and the savior, which communicates that God designed the universe in such a way that we could gain the righteousness we don't have. So we're coming to that. I mean, that's what's wonderful about this. In fact, I argue if all you look at is Isaiah, you can see the plan of salvation laid out in the book of Isaiah just by looking at what God says about the creator of the universe, which is why we're kind of going through all these passages. You know, step by step, it reveals us. But yeah, glory is basically talking about all the great attributes of God and how much greater they are than what we have. I mean, we reflect the glory of God. There's a glory in every human being. In fact, uh, one counselor told me, the secret to being a good counselor is no matter how much trouble the person is in you're talking to, look for the glory of God revealed in that person and help that person see how God has made them as a reflector of his glory. That's kind of step one to actually say, you know what, I guess my problems aren't that big. Uh, there's a God out there that's bigger than I am and I got hope that I can get past these things uh, that could be a problem. Okay, and Isaiah 40, verse 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand or marked off the heavens with the span of his hand? Who has gathered the dust of the earth in a measure? Okay, now God doesn't really have a hand, God is spirit, uh, but this is a figure of speech is being used to make the point that we have a creator who created the universe in such a way that every little drop of water, every little speck of dust was created by God. It has a purpose. Uh, it's been measured by God. He knows exactly how much it is. And if he does that with a speck of dust, with a drop of water, where he carefully measures it, uh, he's got a purpose for it, he's determined it, what does it say about you and me? Uh, aren't you bigger and more a complex than a speck of dust or a drop of water. Okay, Isaiah 40, 22. And this is where we ended. So I'm gonna have you get involved here because this is where we ended last week. Isaiah 40, 22. God is enthroned above the circle of the earth. Its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like thin cloth and spreads, up, spreads them out like a tent to live in. Okay, what is this text saying? about the universe, the creation event, and about God and his role in creation. And it's saying a bunch of things. This is a very uh, compact uh, text here. And actually, we were gonna come back to it because I got a question on that sheet for you where we talk about what does Isaiah say about the configuration of the earth? And this is one of the texts in Isaiah that addresses the configuration of the earth. So. Okay, 
Bertie and I were talking about how the Hebrew vocabulary is very much smaller than the English vocabulary. In English, we get a separate word for circle and sphere. In Hebrew, they got one word that can mean either one. So you could translate this passage, God sits enthroned above the orb of the earth, or the sphere of the earth, or the circle of the earth. Those are all legitimate translations of this text. Doug? It must have been very challenging to uh, translate the Old Testament from the Hebrew into the Septuagint. Right? Because the, Septu the Septuagint is the Old Testament, right? I yeah, and that's Greek. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, Greek is very precise, right? That's well, the point Greek thing. Yeah. yes, but it's not as challenging as putting it into English. Okay. Uh, the Greek vocabulary was much bigger than the Hebrew vocabulary but nowhere near the size of the English vocabulary. Really? Because I've heard about all the different tenses and all that. But oh yeah, the grammar is, is, is more precise. Because yeah, the problem with Hebrew is you don't have a, a very precise grammar. But in Greek, you've got a very precise grammar. It's more precise than English. Uh, but you're dealing with a vocabulary size that's about a factor of four or five times bigger than biblical Hebrew, uh, rather than a factor of uh, 100,000 times bigger like you got in English. So, so yeah, it's a challenge, and that's why it took the Hebrews so long to translate their Hebrew Old Testament into Greek. But what happened was, uh, you know, after the destruction of the second temple, um, or probably the first temple, the diaspora, you had Jews being scattered all over uh, Europe and uh, near, uh, you know, Western uh, Asia. And so uh, in the second century BC, uh, Koine Greek Greek was kind of the common language, kind of like what English is today, where no matter what your native language is, you probably know English as a second language. It was like Greek was like that. The Romans knew Latin and Greek. Uh, the Hebrews knew Hebrew and uh, Greek or Aramaic and Greek. So no matter what language uh, was your native language, you also knew Greek, which is why the New Testament was written in Greek because it could communicate to these people living in all these different provinces of uh, Parthia and the Roman Empire. Uh, but even in the second century, the Jews said, hey, we've got synagogues all over the Greek Empire. Uh, we need to translate the Old Testament into Greek. Well, no doubt God planned it that way, but do you think that it was mostly because of Alexander the Great conquering a lot of the known world? Like Certainly. Africa, yeah. No, that's, that's definitely true. I mean, that did not happen until after the establishment of the, uh, the Greek Empire. And that's what kind of inculcated Greek as a language into all these different uh, national groups. So that became a critical vehicle for taking the gospel message to all these different peoples. It was written in a language that most of them had some access to. Okay. God is enthroned above the circle of the earth. We already talked about how that word for circle could be sphere, orb, or circle. A number of scholars have made the point it really doesn't matter which one you use because it says God it sits enthroned above the earth. Okay, think of some NASA photo of the earth from outer space where you actually get to see the whole of the earth. What does it look like? It looks like a circle. Okay, so any photo of the earth from say hundreds of thousands of miles away is going to show the earth as a circle because uh, you know it photographs two dimensions. So people have made the point, hey, you know, forget about whether it's talking about the earth being a flat uh, disk or being uh, a sphere. If God is a throne above the earth, there's only one object that always looks like a circle and that would be a sphere. A disk does not look like a circle from all different perspectives above, but a sphere always looks like a circle from every perspective above. So people have argued, hey, this idea that the Bible is a flat earth book. You know, many years ago, I debated the president of the Flat Earth Society on radio. He was trying to claim that the earth was a flat earth book, and I said, well, give me a passage. Interestingly, he quoted this one, and saying this proves that the earth is flat, because it says it's a circle. So he says, it's a disk. And I said, oh, you mean it doesn't have corners? I said, what do you do with a text that talk about the four corners of the earth? 
And so he says, well, he basically got off the line, and that was the end of the, uh, <laughs> the debate. So uh, I was hoping that he would stay on the radio a little longer because it's going to make the point, you know, they, the word for corners that you see used in Scripture, because Hebrew is such a small language, it can also be translated the four quarters of the earth. And think of an orange that you cut up in the quarters, okay? You get a different uh, figure of speech. Again, the problem being is, People were trying to discern the Bible as a flat earth book because they're looking at the English translation and taking a very narrow uh, definition of the words rather than looking at the original Hebrew. Yes? Uh, on the second sentence, you, uh, you said you don't know the book of Genesis. Well, there again, is it, in the subject of that sentence, is that talking about mankind or is it talking about God himself? Do you understand what I'm trying to say there? Yeah, it's basically saying God is the one that does all this. But uh, let me stop for a minute because this whole debate about how to interpret the circle of the earth, it says its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. That tells you that God is far enough away from the earth and looking down on the earth as a circle that we creatures look like little grasshoppers. So we're not talking God being just, you know, uh, 5,000 feet above the surface of the earth, he's far enough away that we look like uh, grasshoppers. And basically making the point, hey, if you look at the universe, we are, in the words of Carl Sagan, just an insignificant speck in the vastness of the universe, but we're an important speck. So, but yeah, in that context, yes, I think Steve. Yeah, that's true. But if you're up on a high enough mountain, you can actually see some of the curvature of the Earth. So some of you have actually done that. Although the flat Earth people I know say, oh, that's just refraction. You're not really seeing the curvature of the Earth. And I'm saying, well, how do you explain the fact that uh, when you're up high, you get to see a lot farther away than if you're down in the plane in spite of the refraction? Because we can measure the refraction effect. It's not just refraction. You're actually able to see farther away, and that's why they always put a sailor up in the crow's nest mm -hmm. of a sailing ship, because they put him high enough above the deck that he could see a little farther away, and if the world was really flat, he could see a little bit farther away, but not much. Yes? You can pick up curvature from about a mile. Yeah. Not much. Yeah, you don't need you much. Can you can look back and see that you can actually pick it up. So, <coughs> where, I mean, I've been in airplanes at 45,000 feet, it's really obvious at that elevation. You can see see the curvature quite well. So, okay, uh, you were bringing the question up, what about he stretches out the heavens like a thin cloth and spreads them out like a tent to live in? Um, and I chose this translation because it actually makes the whole point that uh, we're talking, it talks about the material that makes a tent, but the, uh, actually there is this connotation we're talking a thin cloth layer rather than a thick cloth layer. So, any comments on this? Yes. Well, that reminded me of the universe being spread out and that there's nothing in the middle. You're just like on the skin of a balloon. There's the universe that's spread out. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and this passage is, I mean, this passage is actually repeated. You'll actually see other texts that talk about how God stretches out the heavens. Uh, kind of like a tent which we can live in. Um, and there's debate. Is this just simply a figure of speech? Is it actually implying that uh, the universe is a surface effect? I could go either way on it because after all, only talking about two texts in the Bible that address this thing. But I find it interesting is that even if you take it literally rather than as a figure of speech, it's accurate in the sense that, uh, yeah, uh, all the stuff of the universe is on the surface. There's nothing outside, there's nothing inside. If you keep in mind that we're talking a three-dimensional surface instead of a two-dimensional surface. Please don't try to visualize it, it can't be done. But analogy I've used with the lay audiences is to say, <coughs> the universe as we astronomers measure it is kind of like planet Earth. 
where planet Earth is three dimensions. And we human beings live on the two-dimensional surface of the three-dimensional Earth. When it comes to the universe, all the stars, galaxies, planets, all the space-time dimensionality, all the energy is constrained to the three-dimensional surface of the four-dimensional expanding universe. So just add one dimension to the Earth and it all makes sense, <laughs> as long as you don't try to visualize it. <laughs> so, but yeah, and that sense is consistent with this text, which is basically what? saying that the universe is akin to a tent, because that's what a tent is, right? The reality of the tent is not what's inside the tent or beyond the tent, it's the cloth that makes up the tent. And it actually creates a place that we can live. Well, likewise, because of the way God designed the surface of the universe, the three-dimensional surface of the universe, we can live on this universe. Because, yeah, what if it wasn't a three-dimensional surface in a four-space-time dimension? You can't visualize it, but we wouldn't be able to live here. If it was, but if we were actually thinking of something uh, that had interior and exterior to it, it would not be a habitable universe. So, so the universe is where the singularity was. Is yeah, you don't want to be there. That's hollow, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, there's nothing there. There's no planets or stars there anymore because they're out here instead of... Well, one of the most common questions I get is uh, this idea, Hugh, you're an astronomer. Tell me where the center of the universe is. And I said, well, that's akin to you asking me a question, which city on the surface of the Earth <coughs> is at the center of the Earth? And the answer is they're all the same distance from the center. Nothing, no city is at the center of the Earth. Well, likewise, there's no location on the space-time surface of the universe that's at the center of the universe. I mean, there's not even space and time there. And beyond the surface, there's no space and time. Space and time is constrained to the surface of the universe, just like our transportation system is constrained to the surface of our three-dimensional Earth. You can't drive a freeway to the surface, to the center of the Earth. And uh, you can't take a freeway to get to the moon. Uh, you have to use other means of transportation to get there. So if you've got a car uh, and it doesn't have wings, you're constrained to the surface uh, of the Earth. Well, okay, if you go back in time to the very beginning of the universe, yeah, that's the point uh, from which everything came from. But no more. Well, it's because the universe has expanded from that. So, no quote, the center of it all, of its beginning, is simply not accessible. When we astronomers look out at the universe, we're constrained to look along the surface. However, we can get a little closer to that uh, point than you can looking out uh, across the street here, because as we look far away, we're looking back in time. And as we look back in time, we're looking at the surface of the universe <coughs> being smaller than it is today. And in that sense, being closer to that point of beginning some people refer to as a center. But, but the wasn't really an explosion or a bang per se, was it? It was like a something different. Well, astronomers really don't like the analogy that the universe is like an exploding bomb or a grenade. Because when you explode, if I were to explode a grenade here in the classroom, some pieces of the grenade would move faster than other pieces. What we see with the universe, everything is moving at the same velocity which is why they prefer the word picture of blowing up a balloon. Because you blow up a balloon, that surface of the balloon moves away from the center of the expansion at the same rate everywhere. Assuming you've got a balloon that doesn't have weaker surfaces on it. Um, and so everything is the same distance uh, from that center, but there's no access to that center. Well, yeah, I mean, if you get the crater in the cosmos, the latest edition, I talk about how we now, we astronomers can now measure the shape of the universe. And our measurements tell us 
It doesn't look like it's spherical. It doesn't look like it's saddle shaped. It looks like it's flat. But it's flat in four dimensions, not in two dimensions. Four dimensional flat uh, universe. Don't try to visualize it. Okay, keep this in mind. Uh, one of the reasons why we know Christianity and the Bible is from God, it contains teachings we can't visualize. One reason why we know all the other holy books are not from God, their content is limited to that which we can visualize. That's evidence that they came from a human being because it shows limitations of human visualization. The Bible, as you notice, is unique in claiming that God is a trinity. It's unique in claiming that uh, God controls everything but gives us free will. You don't see that in the other religions. It's unique to Christianity because it's beyond what we can visualize. And you say, well, how do we know that's true? Physics and astronomy are loaded with all kinds of things we know for certain are true, but we can never visualize it. So yeah, one of the things you have to do in trying to communicate the Christian gospel to people who are not yet Christians is say, there is truth out there that you can't visualize. Because I know a lot of people say, I won't accept this gospel you're telling me until I can completely visualize it. Can't be done. Yeah, go ahead, Steve. Um, the idea of a four well, a comment and a question. This idea of a four-dimensional universe on a two-dimensional sphere or surface uh, has come up before. Uh, sometimes I've heard it explained differently as raisin bread, where right. uh, different objects uh, are in an expanding loaf of bread. And we're somewhere in the loaf, and we don't know where the edges of the bread is. Just we know that everything's expanding, and we don't know where the center is. Yeah, you're right, and astronomers don't like that analogy. They prefer an analogy where all the raisins are on the surface of the expanding loaf. That, that's actually closer to reality. Okay, good. <laughs> There are some indications, but we don't know. We're in the center of something. We're in the midst of something. So my question to you is uh, for a, uh, maybe a suggestion, or, uh, not an RTB book, but something that an RTB book would support about the four dimensions or three dimensions on a two-dimensional surface that we could find on our computer browsers to help us. Yeah, they all have limitations. Because what all these astronomers are trying to do is kind of give you an analogy for what the geometry of the universe is like. The problem is almost every lay reader doesn't like the analogy. We're just even looking for anything. Yeah. I'm not defining it really well. We can come up with anything. Well, one thing I can share with you is that the uh, loaf with raisins in it that's rising with the, as the yeast uh, expands it, uh, that's a not as good an analogy as a balloon with raisins on the surface. So if you can come look at a website or something sometime to help us because we don't want to do this just very much and you're maybe four or five times. And we sort of all go in on it. Well there's lots of websites, Steve, that use the balloon analogy where they put dots on the balloon. Right. Those are the best. But keep in mind those analogies also are incomplete. And I'd like to follow up, too, about what your astronomer friend at Carnegie said, where we got some idea of the geometry of the universe. And you'll see this in the Crater in the Cosmos, fourth edition. Yeah, we now can measure the geometry of the universe to four places a decimal, but that's probably the best we'll ever be able to do, regardless of advancing technology. <coughs> There's actually things inherent in Big Bang cosmology that make it impossible to determine the geometry any more accurately than that. But the four places of decimal, it looks like it's flat. But it still leaves the door open that it could be slightly spherical or slightly saddle shaped. And the sad news is we'll probably never know.
<laughs> Expanding flat balloon where the balloon has four dimensions of space and time. Okay, that, that's close. Yeah. Well, I think what I said earlier is significant in the sense that if it were any different than this thing we can't visualize or imagine or come up with a decent analogy to communicate it, we wouldn't be here. It's got to be in this unimaginable context for there to be a possibility of physical life in the universe. So stop trying to visualize it. Uh, and you'll find the best analogies you can on the web. As I think the ones that come the closest are basically uh, this, the balloon. That's true. But it's spherical, yeah. I mean, well, I mean, some of the better websites I've looked at say, so you know, it could be an expanding saddle shape. But you can't blow up a saddle, <laughs> so. <laughs> so the bottom line is all analogies uh, for the expanding universe break down. And don't be surprised about that. All analogies we have for the Trinity at some point break down. I mean, that's kind of what I did in uh, Beyond the Cosmos, is give you what I thought were the best analogies for the biblical doctrine of the Trinity. But even the best analogies fail uh, to communicate what the Trinity is really all about. So we have to be satisfied with communicating some of the truths of Big Bang cosmology. Don't try to explain it all. It can't be done. And uh, I think the astronomer you talked to said it right. I mean, we have some understanding, but there's limitations. Yeah, go ahead. Now, there's a big difference between flat and sphere. And uh, so, and you know, how astronomers do this, they measure something called the critical density of the universe. And so, uh, if it's less than one, um, it is uh, saddle shaped. Or, pardon me, more than one, it's saddle shaped. Less than one, it's, uh, you know, yeah. More than one, it's uh, spherical. Less than one, it's saddle shaped. If it's exactly one, it's flat. So flat is that boundary line between a saddle-shaped universe and a spherical universe. And so it's either flat or very, very slightly saddle-shaped or very, very slightly spherically shaped. And um, as I was just mentioning earlier here, we may know, may never know which one it is. But it's got to be really close to flat for us to be here. Now, I think what's fun, there's actually research being done now that might establish that it slightly departs from flatness. And they're actually looking at it in terms of context. What do we need to get advanced life in the universe? Uh, if it's perfectly flat, does that eliminate the possibility of life? And maybe there's a very slight departure. And then again, how many places of the decimal does that have to be flat for us to be here? Those, these are still unanswered questions. You had a comment. Well, you know how pita bread has a little hollow shape? Oh, pita bread, OK. <laughs> Okay. Uh, now, where are you going to put the raisins? <laughs> no raisins. <laughs> no raisins. <laughs> okay, over here, Doug. Um, I hope people don't mind me saying this, but my uh, wife has little interest in this stuff at all, and even less knowledge about it, I think. And I love to talk about this stuff. When we die, are, am I going to understand more about it? And is she going to understand more about it? Do you think she will she want to understand more about it? And am I going to be So what's this class going to be like when we're in the new creation? Is that your question? <laughs> we'll recognize each other. <laughs> well, I'll go to uh, 1 Corinthians 2.9. Uh, it's going to be beyond anything that any of us can think or imagine. I don't think we're going to be talking about this kind of stuff at all. Uh, we're going to be talking about something far more wondrous. And yeah, I don't think our curiosity will ever go away. Or, you know, God made us curious and we get a new creation. We're going to be in a non-stop uh, college course, learning about the glory of God. And it's going to be really fun. And uh, we're all going to be excited about it. So, but the stuff we're talking about now, it's like, ah, it's old hat. So we had that figured out a long time ago. Yeah. There's a question here somewhere? OK. Yeah. Since we're going to get a whole new universe, you're probably not going to care about this one. Well, 
I think what's going to happen, God's going to say, you know, you probably wondered why I made the universe the way I did. And I know you got some good answers, but let me tell you the whole story. So he'll tell us that. And the angels are going to be listening. Yeah, yeah, we want to know too why you made it this way. Or and, you uh, might scratch your head and go, oh, that's all? <laughs> or you might want to say, well, what was my role in all of this? I can understand why you made all these angels and all these other people, but why me? And God will explain to us why we played a critical role. And then we're going to want to know everybody else's critical role. I mean, hey, you got eternity, so there's going to be a lot of stuff for us to explore. Okay, over here. Well, you're making a good point. In the new creation, we're not going to be sitting on harps or on clouds playing harps. Uh, God's got a task for each one of us to do. He says, I'm going to make you caretakers with me of the new creation. So uh, every one of us is going to be a manager. And we're going to have a task in managing a component of God's creation. So... Uh, so I've explained here in the class before, our life here in these few decades we have on this planet, it's all training, preparing us for future careers in the new creation, which is why we're not to take life uh, uh, lightly. Over here, and then I want to get back to, because I'm gonna, running out of time. Go ahead. Comment on the definition, uh, the interdefinition, for lack of a better term, of New Jerusalem and New Creation. Okay, New Jerusalem and New Creation. Um, Revelation 21 speaks about a time when the universe will have fulfilled its purpose. God created the universe to be a tool to eliminate evil and suffering. And when that happens, as he spoke the universe into existence, he'll speak it out of existence, and then he brings in the new creation. As it tells us in John 14, Jesus told his disciples, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. It's a brand new creation not this universe. I say this because there's a lot of teaching going on today saying we're going to spend eternity here on earth. Yeah. One reason why I think that can't possibly be true, yeah. I think God's going to save a lot more than just one or two billion of us. In which case, we need something bigger. And that's where the New Jerusalem comes in. Because it tells us in Revelation 21 that here's this new earth and the New Jerusalem comes out of heaven and sits on the earth. But it talks about this angel with a measuring rod, and he measures the size of the city that comes out of... Now, keep in mind, we're probably not talking length, width, and height, but it is a realm of dimensions because you see in Revelation 21 that it's actually measuring the sizes of the different features. It talks about this angel with a measuring rod. And when you look at the measurements given there, it tells us that the New Jerusalem measures 1,500 miles approximately on one side, 1,500 miles on another, and 1,500 miles on a third. Now, I don't know how many dimensions of space there are in the new uh, creation, but it tells us this is a structure that in the equivalent of our three dimensions of space measures 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles. Now, again, in the context of what we can visualize in three space dimensions, that means a structure is either a pyramid or a cube, or maybe some other exotic uh, three-dimensional object. Uh, but that thing uh, wouldn't really fit on our Earth. Our Earth is too small to accommodate something of that size. This is a single building that resides on the new Earth, which tells me the new Earth has a whole lot more living space than our planet. And well, yeah, well, it tells us there's no death. Uh, it tells us there's no darkness. Uh, and if you've got this uh, building, it tells us there's no gravity. Because if there's gravity, you're not going to have a building 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles. Gravity will remove the corners. And the text is explicit. This building has corners. 
because it talks about the different cornerstones of the building. Now, there's certain jewels at the base of those uh, cornerstones. So that tells us there's no gravity, or we're talking a very different kind of force than the force of gravity, because this is something that can sustain structures of those great dimensions. And some scholars have speculated that the New Jerusalem uh, might be an apartment complex uh, where we all get a flat and uh, you can leave that flat anytime you want. So, uh, you know, uh, in large cities of the world, for example, they have these big buildings uh, where maybe 20,000 people live in the building because they all have flats. And say the first fixed floors are movie theaters and restaurants and department stores, laundromats, uh, lawyer offices, all that kind of stuff, doctor's offices. And basically, you don't have to leave the building. Everything's there. So, uh, and if you go to the big Asian cities or places like uh, Toronto, you can see those kinds of uh, building uh, structures. And people have said, well, maybe the New Jerusalem is like that. It's a place where you've got a flat, but it's not a place to where you're confined. You've got access to the entirety of the New Earth and the New Heavens. So you can come and go. But what's interesting, you can put 30 billion human beings in that building if it's got a cubicle type shape where every one of us in just our apartment flat could have two championship golf courses and a ski run with 10,000 vertical feet. Every individual can have something that big. So it just shows you this new Jerusalem actually has a larger living space than the entire surface of planet Earth. And yet we're not limited. That's just where. So when it says, I'm making a mansion for you, we're talking way bigger than the mansions you see in Arcadia. Way bigger. Yes. Okay, if all redeemed humanity are living inside that New Jerusalem, then who or what is outside on the left of the Earth? Well, what will we be managing? Well, interesting question because all I see in the text is that we're going to be ruling over the angels and the kingdoms God creates. And you know, what are those kingdoms? Are that new species of life forms? So are we going to be managing the equivalent of uh, bears and lions that are existing in multiple dimensions uh, and are uh, you know, eating whatever or maybe they don't eat at all? I don't know. So God may be creating, and people have speculated, maybe he's going to create intelligent life forms. After all, he made the angels, he made us. Maybe he's got in mind another species, and we're going to be ruling over them. Who knows what that means, what that word the kingdom means? Leaves a lot of room for speculation. I like to go back to 1 Corinthians 2.9. Whatever God does in that new creation, it's greater, more glorious, more loving, uh, more rewarding than any one of us can think or imagine. Which tells me, let your imagination run wild and realize it's greater than that. And incidentally, that's an exhortation from both the author of Hebrews and the Apostle Paul. Both of them made the point, every day as a follower of Jesus Christ, spend some time meditating about how great you think your future reward will be. Whatever you come up with, it's better than that. So... I'm out of time, but I'll take one more quick comment. You know what really puzzles me about this, though, is Jesus said, narrow is the gate that enters to heaven, and few are they that find it. And then there's another passage where Paul says, or is it Peter, where he says that uh, the righteous are scarcely saved. And so I think there's a lot of mystery about how many people are going to be in there. Well, there is. And so, for example, scholars who are making the point that this planet, Earth, is going to be our eternal home, they're basically pointing out to that passage. Narrow is a gate. You know, we're not talking 10% of humanity becoming followers of Jesus Christ. We're talking 0.1%. Well, what does that say about all of us here in the class, if it's only 0.1%? Um, but the passage I lean on is the one that's in Zechariah 13 where it says a day will come when a third of all the living Jews will recognize the one that they have pierced and they'll worship him, which communicates a day will come when a third of all living Jews will become followers of Jesus Christ. 
Now, Jesus did make the point repeatedly. Narrow is a gate. It will not be a majority. But I think he was also making the point, it will not be a tiny minority. It's going to be a big minority. So it won't be 50%. It won't be 80%. But it could be 30%. It could be 35%. In which case, this planet is way too small. And, you know, my friends who have this idea that this is going to be our permanent home, I say, what are you going to do with the physics of the sun? Because the sun will continue to get brighter and brighter. In fact, as an astronomer, I can tell you, within less than a million years, this planet will be uninhabitable for human beings. Because yeah. it's not going to be possible to go with that reaction and pull more carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Yeah, we can pull more carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere with all these fir trees and all the rain falling on the silicates. The problem is, right now, if that continues much more into the future, it will pull so much carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere that photosynthetic life everywhere on planet Earth dies. And if all photosynthetic life dies, we have nothing to eat. And we die. But we will go first. Uh, the photosynthetic life will last longer than us. But because we have to eat so much, we're going to be one of the first to go. So, uh, but uh, <laughs> don't be discouraged. I think God's going to redeem humanity in a lot less time than it's going to take for the sun uh, to make our planet uninhabitable. And hey, if you wait long enough, the sun will get so big, it will include the orbit of the earth. A time will come when our sun will incinerate, vaporize the earth. So hey, when you go home tonight, uh, just tell your children that. That'll get them all excited about the future. <laughs> well, let them know that's not going to happen for another four billion years. And that God's got plans to take us out of this universe in a whole lot less than four billion years. We actually got some texts kind of talking about that, but we'll get to that next week. Let me close this in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this rich text of the book of Isaiah. Thank you, Lord, for how... Isaiah, in the midst of uh, great uh, chaos and doubt about God, spoke so clearly to the people of Israel about who you are and how you're in control of everything. And Father, those of us today, we live in a century where there's just so much uncertainty and chaos in the world, and where all of us are impacted by even the uh, smallest of events that exist thousands of miles away. Lord, I pray you would dispel our fear that you would help us recognize based on what we see here in the text, everything is under your control. Everything, including human beings, is under your control. If you control all the stars, you control us. If you control the specks of dust, you control us. But Father, I pray you give us a spirit of humility to follow you as you carve out the path for each one of us to follow. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.